take note. You are listening to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. Each month, we accompany our guest on his or her musical journey. From the very first moment of inspiration with the instrument of their choosing, or in this case, of our guest's parents' choosing, This month, our guest is jazz legend Gary Burton, who began to play the vibraphone at the age of six. When his parents noticed his musical curiosity and thought, well, our daughter already plays the piano, Uh, we can't have Gary play piano also, and they hooked him up with the vibraphone, an instrument he would master so well that, as he puts it, anybody who plays it knows who he is. So this episode of Music Is My Life is unique because, as Gary has recently proclaimed, his musical life is about to end soon. He has announced that he is retiring after this upcoming tour, which means you definitely have to go see him. Plenty of opportunities. The tour begins March 1st in Washington, D.C., comes to Berklee College of Music on March 5th, brings him to Birdland for five nights in New York City, and ends where it all started for Gary, in Indianapolis, Indiana, on March 17th. In his musical career, Gary Burton has released 66 albums, won seven Grammy Awards, and somehow managed to find time to be involved with Berklee College of Music pretty much the whole time. As a teacher in the 1970s, as Dean of Curriculum in the 80s, as Executive Vice President in the 90s, and currently as an instructor of jazz improvisation for Berkeley Online. But let us begin where Gary began with Berkeley in the early 1960s. I came to Berkeley as a student uh, when I was 17 years old, and that, you know, really kind of introduced me to the jazz world. I grew up in a small farm town in Indiana, so... um, uh, arriving in the big city of Boston and finally having lots of other musicians around was just amazing. And uh, from there on, you know, my career just had kept, you know, moving forward and unfolding. Uh, I spent 10 years in New York, but I was still connected to the school in a lot of ways. And that, that a lot of the musicians I knew were fellow you know, alumni from Berkeley. So I still felt like I was part of the greater Berkeley scene. And, and of course, then in 71, I came back to Boston and uh, started my career working at Berkeley, uh, teaching uh, originally. It was my first uh, role at the school uh, for the first decade I was there. Right. Now, now, how would a high school graduate in 1960 find out about Berkeley? Well, you know, I was a vibraphone player, which already made me kind of an, uh, you know, a unique uh, animal. Uh, it wasn't a very common instrument. It isn't even to this day. And I was a jazz musician. So when I was finishing high school and excited about trying to, you know, go into the world of jazz, which I was mostly connecting to through listening to records like everyone else I knew in those days um, there were only two schools in the whole United States that welcomed uh, you if you played jazz Uh, that was Berkeley in Boston and North Texas down in Denton Texas and and neither of them offered vibraphone (laughs) so so, I ended up choosing Boston because after all it was a city and I you know, I already felt deprived growing up in rural Indiana. So I wanted to be where musicians were, where there was a scene. And so Boston looked like the place to go. And Berkeley was wonderful about it. They said, you know, um, we don't have a vibraphone teacher, and it's not one of our official instrument categories that you can major in, but you're welcome to play it. Anytime you in any ensembles in any projects or anything, uh, you just have to choose another instrument to be your instrument major. So I picked I picked piano because it was similar to the vibes, and I'd already been kind of playing the piano in a somewhat self taught amateur way. So that was the logical instrument to pick, and it turned out 
uh, to be a really good learning experience uh, during those Berkeley years with taking piano lessons, both classical and uh, jazz, you know, um, materials. And, uh, and it affected my vibes playing very positively as well. Mm-hmm. Now, basically, the, the format of this podcast, and uh, I've got a little bit ahead of ourselves, is, is we kind of go through the, the journey of uh, a person's musical life. And, and I know you've done, done that quite a bit with learning to listen. And so excuse me if there are some parts of you repeating yourself. But um, now you started at age six. Yes. My um, parents wanted all three of us kids in the family to uh, get to have music lessons, something they had you know, been deprived of growing up in the Depression. And so my older sister had already started taking piano lessons. And I started hanging around watching her practice and getting in the way and asking questions and, you know, uh, figuring out what was going on. And then when my father noticed that I would say things like, oh, no, that's supposed to be an E-flat, not an E-natural, uh, he realized that, you know, I was, you know, picking up the, the music information on my own and that, you know, that I was probably ready to start taking lessons, too. But they had to pick another instrument. And just coincidentally, there was uh, the town we lived in then, Anderson, Indiana, uh, there was a lady who, locally who played the marimba and the vibraphone and gave lessons. So that's where my parents took me. It wasn't my choice. I wouldn't know at six, you, you know, you wouldn't know one instrument from another. And um, so, but that's how I got introduced to the mallet instruments and started playing them. And we moved a few couple of years later, actually, um, to another uh, part of the state. And so I lost my teacher. But I had enough of a start to just keep on going by myself. My father, my father would order music from a store, music store in Chicago, and uh, and I would, you know, get the music and figure out how to play it. And pretty soon I was playing local gigs uh, at churches and the Lions Club and things like that. Um, and by the time I was 10, uh, I was pretty much, you know, working, uh, you know, the, about the same frequency of schedule that I've worked all my life. Uh, that is playing, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 gigs a year. Um, uh, just all that changed was the music and the, and the places <laughs> that right. I played. Right, right. And now, did, did your sister, you know, she got the piano. She had already chosen it. Did, did she end up sticking with it? No, my sister and my brother, uh, we all played sort of for the fun of it, as a, like a, for the, with the family. And we had sort of a family band for a few years there. But neither of my siblings uh, stuck with it. That's fine. Uh, you know, they, uh, it was fun for a while. And then as soon as my sister got into high school and, you know, uh, dating boys and you know, social life in high school, she lost interest in the music. And sort of the same thing happened with my brother who discovered sports. Right. And what was he playing? He played bass and clarinet. We all doubled on something. Okay. Uh, I I played uh, drums somewhat, uh, but uh, mainly the mallet instruments and a little bit of piano and and trumpet. And my sister played trombone as well as uh, piano. These were things that we could play in the high school band because mm-hmm. you can't pl- you can't play the vibes or the piano in the high school band. So right. in order to be part of the band, you had to play a more band like instrument. So we we all seemed to have a, a second instrument that we could get by with. And now, do you think you would have stayed with music if if it weren't for the vibraphone? I mean, did you have a moment where you said, well, I, I really like this instrument? I, I mean, you must have somewhere along the line. Well, not, you know, that came later. Um, I, was, I was conflicted about the vibraphone for a, a number of years, right up until I was already through Berkeley and had moved to New York. Uh, I was still had doubts lingering about did I pick a, a bad choice for an instrument to become you know skilled at playing because not many knew about the vibraphone. Right. And I f- I figured well is this going to limit my career possibilities? Should I have been a, been smarter and f- focused on piano instead or something? And um, finally, um, it was a. Uh, a New York musician, a guitarist named Jim Hall, who 
in a conversation with me about this when I was lamenting, you know, the popularity or lack of of the vibraphone. He said, doesn't matter what you play, it just matters whether you can do it really good or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of made sense, so I, I stopped fighting it. Uh, but along the way, I kept trying other instruments. I bought a flute, I bought a saxophone, I tried the trumpet, I bought a guitar, and would try. It. I would get up to the point where I could sort of, in an amateur way, play a song or two on each of these instruments. And just kind of to see if if it was clicking for me, and it never did. And, you know, the one instrument that just felt like it was part of me was the the vibraphone that I just kept coming back to. And there was this moment that happened because of uh, the very first jazz band camp that happened in 1958. I was in high school, and up to that point. My life ambition, my plan, as I had it, was that I was going to go to either medical school or engineering. My father was a chemical engineer, and uh, I I got good grades in school, so uh, I was kind of looking in that direction for a career. And it never occurred to me that music would be the the choice. Right. Uh, it was fun. Music was fun. I found it easy to learn and fun to do, but didn't you know, I couldn't picture how it would work as a career, especially starting out in Princeton, Indiana. Right. But I went to the band camp and it was like a revelation. There I was for finally surrounded by another hundred young musicians who were just as eager and excited about it as I was, and these great teachers, quite a few of whom were from Berkeley, um, that were coaching us in the bands that we were rehearsing during that week and so on. So by the time I finished the week, I was so excited about it, I came home and announced to my parents, forget med school, I'm going to be a jazz musician. And to their credit, uh, they didn't blink. <laughs> they uh, they just uh, said, "Oh well, that sounds nice, honey." Um, and and I, looking back on it, I, I give them a lot of credit for for not panicking. Um, I suspect that if I had been in their shoes, I probably would have uh, at least asked a few questions and challenged uh, the, the decision. But um, that that convinced me that music was my future. And uh, and I and I got much more uh, committed to uh, practicing and learning music and finding people to play with and so on. Right now, what what is uh, your own children's uh, musical involvement? Uh, very little interest. Yeah, <laughs> they they my son played a guitar, uh, self taught. Uh, had his own rock band in high school. Uh, as soon as he finished school, the guitar went in the closet, and, and he never played it again. Uh, and my daughter n- never really was interested in music. She's an artist, a uh, very talented painter, and uh, and making things art- you know, artistically. But uh, music wasn't uh, in the cards right. uh, for either for either one of them. And their mother is a musician, also a pianist and a Berkeley uh, graduate. But they. Um, uh, didn't follow in our footsteps, right, right. as it were. Well, it it's, seems like something that maybe skips a generation sometimes. You know, you it could. You don't want to do what your parents have done, or. Well, there were no musicians in my family history. Oh, none. Uh, we 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 kind of looked to see, other than you know, this one or that one sang in the church choir, like my father did. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's not exactly you know playing an instrument or learning you know, being a musician or anything. Now, I did have an interesting detour on my way to Berkeley, which is worth mentioning. Is this Nashville? I was living in... Yes, Nashville. Uh, Who would have thought that I would start my musical career in the the home of country music? And at, you know, while I was... Just as I was finishing high school at that. Um, But there I was, finishing up high school in, in southern Indiana... And a local musician there, a saxophone player named Boots Randolph, uh, had become uh, a, a regular visitor to the Nashville recording scene. Uh, he played on a lot of Elvis Presley records and that sort of thing, you know, when they wanted some tenor sax in the background. And uh, he told me 
that he'd overheard one of the guitar players that worked in the studios uh, heard him just saying that he was going to be making a jazz record and that he was sorry that there weren't any vibraphone players around Nashville because it was a country music town and because he really thought the idea of guitar and vibes would be a, a great combination. So Boots said, well, there's a kid up in Indiana you might want to hear. And a few weeks later, on the next trip to Nashville, I rode along with Boots with my vibraphone in his car and played a couple of songs with the guitarist, whose name was Hank Garland. Uh -huh. And uh, he was impressed and said, well, what are your plans? And I said, well, I'm finishing high school in a few more weeks, and then I'm going to go to college in Boston in September. So he proposed that I come to Nashville for the summer and that we would play at a local club on weekends and we would record this record that, that he had gotten the go-ahead for from his record label. And uh sounded great to me because I had nothing else going on that summer. So as soon as I graduated, loaded up my Volkswagen and drove to Nashville and spent the summer playing gigs and also doing a handful of record sessions for other people. You know, um, people were kind of interested in the fact that there was a new instrument in town that they could add to some of the studio dates. So, uh, in fact, my first gold record was recorded that summer. Uh, there was a piano player named Floyd Kramer who had, he had a hit record called Last Date, and that was his first record ever. He had been a studio player, and, uh, uh, and they, he was, you know, given the green light to make his first uh, record as a leader, and he asked me to play on it. So there I am in the background playing chords softly uh, on Last Date, and, of course, I went ahead and uh, became a gold record. So... Uh, that was my my first of a, of uh, I believe three altogether in my career. None of my own went gold, <laughs> but, but uh, jazz records don't usually do that. Right. But I've been on other pe other people's records. Uh, I did a record with KD Lang, a wonderful singer, and uh, that one uh, was was a big seller. Right. This whole summer, I'm just imagining you as a 18 year old kid, and you know you're not necessarily playing your preferred style of music, but you know, what, what's going through your mind? Is, is your attitude like, well, whatever I can get, and this is just... Like... Oh, well, I was playing my preferred music on the weekends. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Every Friday and Saturday, Sunday, uh, we played at this local club called The Carousel, and uh, and it was a trio with Hank, myself, and a bass player, and we were playing our jazz tunes, and it was, you know, for me, it was the most professional playing setting I'd, I'd yet to, been in and uh, so it was exciting as could be and at, and and the the big extra bonus at the end of the summer um a lot of country people turned out to be kind of closet jazz fans uh -huh. and and every weekend there would be two or three uh, country stars coming into the club to see the trio and one of these was the guitarist chet atkins who also ran RCA's uh, Nashville division. And at the end of the summer, he called me in and said, look, uh, I've been talking to the, the people back in New York, and I convinced them that uh, RCA sh should uh, sign you t to, the, to the label. And uh, you will be, you know, moving to the East Coast, so you'll be, you know, working with the New York people. But, um, you know, we've got a contract to present to you if, if you're interested. So into the summer, I left for Berkeley with uh, maybe a record label, a major record label contract wow. in my pocket. It was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe uh, my, my good fortune. Did everybody in your dorm just seethe with jealousy <laughs> or? <laughs> I don't know. You know, you have to re uh, realize that uh, Berkeley was very small. Right. In 1960. In fact, there was no dorm at, at, that I was. I, the dorm opened the second year I was there, and I and I stayed in that dorm. Okay. And in fact, my roommate was Mike Rindish, who became a longtime teacher at Berkeley and chairman of uh, the uh, electronic music department back in this in the 70s and so on. Um, but um, 
the first year, it, you just essentially found other students and shared apartments. Okay. And there were may, maybe a hundred students total wow. in the school. It was hard. It's hard to imagine how small it was. It was in one brownstone house uh, there on Newbury Street. Yep. And there were about maybe fifteen teachers and a hundred, a hundred and twenty students, something like that. That's amazing. And this. Second year I was there, it grew to more like 150, um, and it kept growing, in fact, from then on by leaps and bounds every year. When I came back 10 years later as, to start as a teacher, it was up to 1,000 students. Mm-hmm. So, And they by then they had bought the first hotel and converted it into a school and so on. Um, Berkeley was you know, growing you know, at a frantic pace during those decades. But when I arrived, it was... A pretty small place, and um, I guess uh, there's no, nobody ever really talked to me about my record contract. Yeah, <laughs> that I can that I can remember, um, and I didn't make my first record until a year later. I mean, I was still in school, and I, ha- I hadn't, and I was just turning eighteen, the middle of that first school year. So. Um, uh, the company even said, "Take your time. You know, you don't have to make your first record in- instantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, get settled in on the East Coast." And and so it was the next summer before I actually went to New York and uh, put together my first, you know, release for RCA Victor. Now, was there any conversation with your parents or you know even with yourself about? You know, after this one magnificent summer, yes, I'm still definitely going to school, or maybe I'll stick around in Nashville. No, uh, I was. I knew that there was no uh, long-term jazz future in Nashville. Right. That that I had to get to the, you know, where the jazz scene was based, which meant the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, the two places on the East Coast, uh, you know, being New York and Boston. And, uh, in fact, I think the main reason that Boston was considered a um, uh, part of the major jazz scene was because Berkeley was there, and that attracted students and teachers, and it became even more so as the school grew over the years. Uh, but Boston was a you know a really lively jazz scene. Mm-hmm. And so I had no regrets going there. It was it was the most exciting two years of my life, probably because I felt free of responsibility because I was a student, right? And uh, all I had to do was make it to the classes and do my work, do my homework, and so on. And I was playing gigs as as much as I could handle. Um, some some were jazz gigs, uh, some were commercial gigs to you know pay the pay the rent and so on. But um, but I was working a lot, which also you know was great experience. Yeah, and tell me a little bit about you know while while you were at Berkeley for those two years, did you learn by you know did you improve by leaps and bounds because of what you were learning in school, or was it you know the outside gigging that helped you learn? No, it well it was you could say it was both, but definitely leaps and bounds describes my Berkeley experience. Mm-hmm. I was I was somewhat self-taught uh, back in Indiana. I did find a local piano player in uh, about an hour away in, in another town that I took some lessons with to just to teach me tunes and how to harmonize them, which turned out to be a good start on uh, learning harmony and music theory. But uh, I had learned a lot of things just from ear, listening to records, but I didn't know what things were called. I didn't know the correct terms for different kinds of chords and why this chord moves naturally to the next one. Uh, I could tell my ear would tell me that it does, but I didn't know, you know what the, the theory behind it was. And Berkeley was great. Uh, they, you know, my classes there filled in information at a uh, rapid fire pace, and, and it was just answering all my questions and filling in the gaps for me. Uh, so, yeah, I learned, you know, uh, just tons of stuff during my time at the school. Mm-hmm. And, and do you feel like you had learned enough by those two years that you were ready to fly, or was it was it the professional window that you were afraid? It was a, well, again, as with m- many things, it was a combination of those two things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a, uh, an aggressive student. I had actually completed about three years worth of courses at the end of two years. Wow. 
taking taking extra classes and jumping in uh, ahead and so on. And uh, and meanwhile, I was getting a growing sense that you know it was a good time to try you know launching a career. And I figured, well, what's to lose? I'll go to New York this in that summer, and if I don't you know find any work. Uh, I'll come back to Berkeley for another year. Mm-hmm. Uh, was you know that was a you know felt fair, like a fairly safe thing to try. Right. And so so I you know found a place to live after I got there, and uh, in a, you know an apartment and settled in and started looking for work and was not finding much. Um, I thought you know there would it would be a little better. But again, I'm, you know, I'm struggling with the fact that I'm a vibraphone player. How many gigs, you know, are, uh, are looking for a vibraphonist. And it turned out there was one that was looking for vibes. And that was the pianist, George Shearing, who normally had vibraphone in his band. And, uh, Marion McPartland, uh, a name most people recognize from her decades long radio shows on NPR, uh, I got acquainted with Marion uh, through another musician uh, who had used to play with Marion and introduced to her, and uh, she very kindly uh, recommended me uh, to George, who was a fellow British piano player, and they were friends. But she apparently gave me a glowing recommendation. And so I got a phone call one day from uh, George's manager saying uh, he'd like to hear me play. So I met him. At the end of August, early September of that summer, when I would have made the decision to go back to school, mm-hmm. but uh, we played a couple of songs in his uh, uh, just together as a duet, and up in his manager's office, and then uh, he had me sight read a piece and so on, and then said, "Well, you, you sound great. I'd love to have you in the band. There's only one, you know, issue, which is I'm not going to work for the next six months." Uh, I'm going to school to get a guide dog. Uh, George was blind. Oh, okay. And um, so, uh, we, but, you know, if you're still available come January, then uh, you've got the job. So I thanked him and went home and said, well, one way or another, I guess I'll be working by January, and maybe something better will come along in the meantime. It didn't really, <laughs> and I uh, just hung out in New York waiting and hoping that something would come along, borrowing money occasionally from my father to uh, pay the rent, and finally January arrived, and they you know, flew me out to Los Angeles to meet up with the rest of the band and start touring, and that you know, was my first full-time uh, road gig uh, in my career. I was 19 when that started. And uh, and turned out to be uh, a quite a good first experience because it was a very professional uh, band. Uh, George was an excellent musician. I learned a lot from him, and from this the experience of, of traveling with you know such a, a bunch of pros. So it was a great start. Mm-hmm. And then around this time, I feel I mean my my knowledge of. Uh... The chronology of jazz is, is not uh, as as I, I didn't live it like you did, but you know when when I do listen to music from that time, vibes do start becoming more commonplace at a certain point. And when did you realize that hey, I might actually be influencing this style of music? Well, I, the history of the vibes is that you know it, it was invented around 1930. And for the first, and so when I started as a six-year-old, it was only twenty years old, right? And and still, you know, a pretty brand new instrument, and uh, just beginning to find a, a you know a following. But by the seventies, sixties, uh, and seventies, it had you know become more known. There were more players, and it's and it's continued to uh, expand uh, even since then. 
over the years. Uh, I just I just know this from the instrument companies telling me that it, at, back in the early days they were selling about 200 instruments a year. Now they sell 2,000 a year. Wow. Uh, because now schools have them for their music departments. Uh, in almost every school that still has a music department has a marimba and a vibraphone in the band room and uh, and so on. So people are introduced to it more uh, more easily. And I think my influence probably didn't become a factor in the popularity of the instrument till I had gotten more established myself, maybe by the 70s. Okay. Once, once I started leading my own band at the end of the 60s, yeah. then I, I suspect that my visibility as a, you know, a, a major player of the vibraphone uh, has had more impact on uh, on the history of the instrument mm-hmm. and uh, and especially at this stage i mean i've been doing this now for decades so uh, i'm sure i'm anybody that that plays the vibraphone you know will know who i am right and, right and the, and the role that i've that i've had in the history of the instrument i mean it was the perfect instrument for me uh timing wise because it, it was still relatively new when I came along, and there were a lot of technical possibilities that were ready to be discovered by somebody. Mm-hmm. And so it fell to me to popularize four mallet playing, uh, dampening, uh, a handful of techniques that are now commonplace for the instrument, but a lot of them are associated with me because I was the first person to really uh, you know, uh, pioneer them. Right. That really is a wonderful honor that like not many people can say that that anybody who plays the instrument that they play they know of you you know that's that's just mm-hmm. yeah that's, i it's it is an honor i have to, i have to say and uh, and like i said if it if it hadn't been the the timing was correct somebody else would have made these same discoveries <laughs> it wasn't something that was unique to my you know uh, talent uh, they were you know, inevitable, and it would you know had I come along twenty years later, you know someone else would be getting the credit for this or that. I was there at the right time, as it turned out. But then you look at you know I I think I was asking that last question because you look at that that clip from that uh, that movie uh, Get Yourself a College Girl where where you're the, in, in there <laughs> playing Girl from Ipanema, yeah. and it just feels so uh-huh. of its time. Well, that's true. Now, that was my uh, during my three years with Stan Getz. Right. Um, Stan was actually looking for a piano player and not finding anyone available. And one of the piano players that he uh, uh, checked with was um, uh, Peggy Lee's accompanist. Uh, Peggy Lee was a famous jazz singer of the 50s and 60s. And... Uh, her pianist um, was a friend of Stan's, and he said, "Well, you know, uh, there is. A, I saw a vibes player recently who played with four mallets, played chords, and we thought, maybe that would work instead of a piano." And it turned out the bass player in Stan's band knew me and vouched f- for me, and so I was invited to come in and sit in with Stan and and the band at a club in New York and see how it would work. It didn't go very well. Uh, they were playing t- tunes, a lot of tunes I didn't know, and even the ones I knew, they had their own arrangements and harmonies and so on. So I was kind of uh, having to do a lot of guessing about what and playing by ear, which you know didn't really give me a chance to shine that much. Mm-hmm. And, at the, and at the end of the night, Stan said, "Well, thanks for trying." And then a, you know, two weeks later, I get the call from my bass player friend again, saying, "Well." Stan's now desperate. Uh, we're leaving for Canada on Monday. Uh, we still don't have a piano player, and he wants me to ask you if you would be willing to do this three weeks in Canada um, until he can find you know someone else. And that's, that was you know not exactly the most thrilling <laughs> job offer. <laughs> Not a lot of confidence there, <laughs> but I figured, what the heck? I wasn't doing anything else. I had, you know, left George Shearing. It was taking a long time off at that long break mm-hmm. at that point. So I was back home in New York, kind of wondering what to do next. And uh, here, here was well, I'll do these few weeks with with Mr. Getz, and then uh, see what happens after that. And during that three weeks, uh, we kind of clicked. 
first it was a little rough. I was trying to figure out how to accompany Stan effectively on the vibes, which was a new thing for me. And he was getting used to, you know, playing with the vibes instead of with uh, piano or guitar. But by the end of the three weeks, we had kind of uh, found a, a sound. And uh, so I ended up staying for three years with the band. And uh, and then one of the, we made two movies during that uh, first couple of years because he you know he had this hit record um, of of you know Brazilian music with the girl from Ipanema and so on. So uh, we were playing almost nonstop uh, touring, but also getting these extra invitations. Uh, in this case, you know, to be in a, a, a a couple of different movies, and one of them was, <laughs> of all things, Get Yourself a College Girl, uh, which was really just an excuse to show uh, a bunch of the uh, uh, musicians that were on the recording label that was also owned by the movie company. So each scene in the movie featured another uh, pop band of some kind. And we were, our setting was uh, a ski resort. Uh, and so we all wore uh, different colored sweaters, and we were supposedly having a rehearsal and playing our our couple of songs with after Gilberto, you know, singing on this the hit song and so on. That's great. Now the years with Stan were uh, ups and downs, as I understand it. Well, Stan was a, um, a serious alcoholic mm-hmm. during that phase of his life. I mean, his early life he was well known as a as a uh, as a heroin addict, right? And um, and in fact, ended up having to leave the country to avoid going to jail, and um, came back ten years later and restarted his career in the U.S. and um, and then I, you know, that's when I came along. Uh, so by that time he had replaced his drug habit with drinking and uh, so and he was somewhat he's what today we would use the term uh bipolar mm-hmm. you know he, he had these extreme mood swings between being very upbeat and and happy and positive about everything and then the next day he would be uh, very angry and paranoid and uh, mean and so on. And so you, you, we kind of got used to uh, the unpredictability of Stan's behavior. And for me, I was still a young guy at this point, kind of inexperienced in the ways of the world. Uh, it was it was a learning experience. This guy who was extremely talented and just a major musician, my goodness, uh, and yet personally you know really hard to you know figure out how to how to work with how to uh, spend so much time with as you do when you're traveling together and playing night after night so um, it was like yeah, I said I learned a lot about people and human nature from that experience and always had great respect for Stan in spite of his demons that he was dealing with and it was uh, certainly a, a, a terrific uh, platform for me uh, that gave me enough exposure to um, be in a spot to start my own band after I, I finished with Stan. Right now, how you, you mentioned, you know, his his demons. How did you? I, I'd imagine. I mean, this might be me answering the question for you, but what was seeing him struggle like that uh, helpful in? you know, keeping that sort of thing at bay for you? Because I imagine it's very prevalent in the touring lifestyle of a jazz musician. Mm-hmm. I didn't take my first drink of alcohol till I was in my 30s. That gives you an idea. Yeah, I, I guess it did make a uh, make an impression on you then. <laughs> and, and I had already had a negative perspective on alcohol from my childhood years when my family group would occasionally play Christmas parties and things for companies. And sometimes uh, drunk people would come up to us as kids and kind of, you know, try to talk to us and be all, you know, scary. So I, I always had a kind of a negative impression of drinking. And with Stan, it really was, you know, in, you know, in spades. So, um, 
uh, like I say, I, I stayed away from it for a long time and only eventually uh, would, you know, have the occasional glass of wine just to be sociable in, a, in with other people was how I finally, you know, got comfortable with, you know, taking a drink occasionally. Right, right. So then, so he gives you, as you said, the platform to start your own uh, group and that that's the Gary Burton Quartet? That's correct. I had been playing rather, you know, straight ahead, traditional kind of jazz with Stan. And then when I was faced with starting my own band, I, I wanted to do something that would be unique, that would set me apart from all the other musicians uh, and bands, uh, you know, that would give us some identity. And at the time, I had become a big fan of the newly arrived uh, rock music. The Beatles were big, Bob Dylan was big, the Rolling Stones were big, and so on. And so I had become a fan of their records and their music. And my idea was to find a way to bring some of these rock music elements into our jazz combo. And the breakthrough was coming across a guitar player who was already kind of doing the same thing, uh, which was Larry Coriel. And um, we met at a just at a jam session one day in New York, and um, uh, here was this guitar player that was had this weird mixture of rock licks and jazz licks all kind of jammed together when he soloed. And I thought this is exactly what I'm, you know, looking for. So I asked him if he wanted to play this week in Boston that I had already booked. Uh, and was one it needed to put a band together for, and he said yes. So that was our first gig, and um, we ended up then, you know, being the Gary Burton Quartet for the next two years before Larry left to start his own bands. Right, and with that, I mean, basically, it's you know the beginning of fusion right there, and with your endeavors to do that, I, I always wondered about. You know, I myself come from more of a rock background, and I've always heard a lot of people kind of talk smack about rock and roll, like, oh, it's just three chords. But how did you combat people who would, I mean, th- there must have been some sort of backlash. Yeah, um, and it was, you know, um, uh, you know, I mean, the first thing that, well, it's only three chords, well, that's what uh, was changing about rock. Here came the Beatles, who had much more sophisticated tunes than what we thought of as as typical uh, rock from the fifties, and uh, so the you know the this this new rock, as it were, was uh, you know a whole new thing, and in fact the the problem for jazz people was that a lot of jazz fans were being uh, drawn over to the rock side because the rock music had suddenly become much more interesting than it used to be. Mm-hmm. And people who were, you know, lifelong jazz fans were now going to, you know, rock concerts and buying Beatles records instead of jazz records. And uh, I caught some, you know, f- negative feedback from uh, from the occasional musician who felt, you know, that it was an act of traitor, uh, treason, you know, to uh, do anything that, you know... Uh, uh, recognize any validity to rock, but I'll tell you, most of the musicians, including the most famous ones who who I knew, um, were very supportive, and were, their attitude was, "Hey, this is something you know interesting, something different." Uh, Duke Ellington, he was one, an early supporter, for instance, who when he would hear my band on jazz festivals uh, that he was also on, uh, would come to me and say. Uh, how he always liked when somebody could come up with something different, something new, new way to use instruments, uh, new kinds of of tune structures, and so on. So um, mostly, I felt you know th- th- there was that there was plenty of encouragement. Oh, that's great! And now uh, you mentioned Duke Ellington, and, and I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, the um, running you had with Miles Davis. <laughs> yeah, well. The Miles story uh, is is a dramatic one, <laughs> uh, and of course Miles was known as a as a pretty uh, outrageous character, and uh, it began with a uh, a newspaper interview 
a, a well-known critic, probably the most uh, established jazz critic of the day, was a guy named Leonard Feather, mm-hmm. who wrote for the Los, Los Angeles Times and also for Downbeat Magazine. So uh, my new band with our our rock you know elements um, had played in L.A. and Leonard's interviewing me, and one of the questions he asked was. Uh, What's it all about here? You know, you're doing this other thing. And uh, I said, well, you know, we can't all just keep playing and imitating Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Uh, we're young musicians. We're we're all out there looking for our own voice, our own uh, identity as players. Now, that sounded like a pretty reasonable uh, explanation to me. But what the headline of the piece in the paper said was Burton says that Miles and Train are old hat, meaning that are now out of date, old fashioned and, and, you know, not worthy. I was stunned when I read that and I called Leonard up immediately and said, how could you? I never said anything like that. They're they're two of my major heroes, for goodness sake. And he kind of insisted that, well, that's what he thought I meant and so on. Well, We moved up to San Francisco a few days later to continue our tour, and I'm playing at a local club, and I come in one night, and the owner approaches me and says, listen, Miles was here today. He was an old friend of the club owner from New York. He said he was here for lunch, and uh, he asked me what was going on at the club these days, and I said, oh, we got this new group that's doing great, this Gary Burton group and he said he got real angry looking and he said tell him if he mentions my name again I'll kill him wow and so the minute I heard that I knew okay Miles somehow uh, happened to read uh, <laughs> the thing that was in the LA Times he must have been in LA uh, the same weekend that we were there so I don't know for sure what happened. I was the the club owner suggested I write him a letter. He knew the hotel he was staying at, and uh, explained that it was it all you know misunderstanding, and that I certainly didn't mean uh, what it looked like, and so on. Which I did. I never, of course, I never got a, a response. And I ran into Miles, you know, many times later on through the decades, and on in airports and on jazz festivals, backstage, and so on. He never spoke to me or acted like he knew who I was, although I'm sure he did. And I didn't have the, I didn't have the nerve to speak to him either. So, uh, we carried on this kind of, uh, keeping our distance, um, thing, you know, from, uh, you know, for the rest of his career. In fact, in fact, I, I shared the stage with him, uh, at a big concert at Tanglewood, um, about a year before he died, and uh, and even I remember even that night backstage, it was like you know I was invisible, which was fine with me. I was you know he 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 terrorized almost everybody, so uh, <laughs> that that's uh, you know just the way it goes with Miles. That's that's amazing though. You played with him, but never spoke with him. No, I never played with Miles. Oh, okay. I, was just, I thought, I we thought were, you were on the stage together playing. No, on the same bill. Oh, you know, yeah, on the same bill. My, right. my band, yeah, my band and his band on the same night. Yeah. No, if we played together, I'm sure we would have spoken. Yeah. Uh, although I, I must say, Miles's band members in the, at that era said we never saw him except on stage. That's wild. He traveled on a different plane. He stayed in a different hotel. Uh, a, a manager would be with us and get us on the stage, get us all ready to go. And then the announcement would say, here's Miles Davis. He would come out. We'd play our six tunes. He would leave. We never saw him wow. in, in, you know, between, between, um, so maybe I, if I was in the band, I wouldn't have seen him, actually. Right, <laughs> I don't know. Right. Well, that, it's an interesting approach. And, and, you know, you've had a career full of playing with many different people. And a lot of what you do is improvisation. And I wonder for you, does having a personal connection with somebody outside of having an instrument that you're playing matter? Yeah. Well, it does to me. Uh, I know of many groups where there's very little personal interaction between the musicians, between the leader and the and the musicians, or between each other. It's you know kind of like we're coworkers, mm-hmm. but no, nothing beyond that. Uh, in my case, um, I've always considered it important to uh, get pretty connected 
to the people I'm playing with. I mean, I'm going to spend so much time with them, you know, off stage as well when we're traveling around in airplanes and cars and so on, that, um, you know, I, we end up in most cases getting pretty uh, close uh, friendships going and um, and spend more time with our fellow musicians and more often than we do with our own families because we're out touring so much. But uh, for me, it's important. Uh, for other people, it, it may not be. It's a, and, you know, it seems to be different uh, approaches to that. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at the time here. We're, we've been spending a lot of time, and we're only at, like, the late 60s. Um, <laughs> so, so then you're named Jazz Man of the Year in 68. That must have felt like a validation of, of the risks you had taken. It did, and that was a surprise, certainly, because uh, normally that went to more of a senior statesman kind of musician who'd been around for a while. Uh, but it was a recognition of this new genre that you know my band had introduced uh, at that time, and um, and, and I you know uh, you know certainly was stunned when 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 the, the magazine came out and uh, that was 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 announced. Um, but it did make me you know again feel you know that yet another kind of validation. Had, had happened. This, these were votes from uh, the fans, not from the other musicians. These were this was the readers' poll. So I said, okay, so people are are definitely noticing, you know, what we're doing here. So that felt good. Right. It's it seems like the the yin to the yang of the Miles Davis the <laughs> quote being uh, taken out of context. And that was the same year too, right? Uh, yes, it would have been. I guess wow. um, that 1968, probably the second year that the band was uh, in full operation. Right, that's great. Um, and then you know you're playing and you're still playing, and then we come to '71 and you come back to Berkeley, and that must have also been a validation because you didn't finish, and here you are teaching. Yeah, of course, Berkeley in those days, especially. Uh, was pretty comfortable hiring former students as teachers, even if they hadn't graduated, um, because after all, it was more more important was what you knew uh, and what ex- and what experience you had gained in the professional world uh, than whether you had a certain piece of paper or not. Uh, in fact, Berkeley in its earliest days didn't even offer degrees. You know, it wasn't a degree. When I was there as a student, it didn't even have the authority to give degrees. It gave what what was called a diploma. Right. But it was not not a degree. That that came along in the mid '60s at at some point. Um, But yes, I you know I I started I started teaching because uh, the 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 uh, format of doing clinics workshops at schools. Uh, was something new around that time, and and I had found myself getting invited to do a fair amount of these during the course of a typical year, and it was sort of a secondary kind of uh, income, as well as the fact that I discovered uh, it came pretty natural to me to explain things, to talk about things, to demonstrate things. Not all not all musicians are uh, all that verbal. You know, a lot of players will, if you ask them, well, why did you do that? Or what, how did you know to do that? And their answer is simply, well, you know, I could, I could just hear it, which doesn't help the student that much. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, that being the case, I got the idea to maybe it would be good to have a, uh, an actual teaching situation that would still allow me to play and tour and gig and so on, but that I could also, you know, put this teaching experience that I was uh, gradually doing more of uh, to work. And naturally, I thought of Berkeley being, uh, you know, the logical place to do it. And they were very receptive and invited me to come. And I wasn't sure if it would, how well it would work out. I thought, well, maybe I'll do this a couple of years and get bored with it, or it won't work with my schedules and so on. We'll have to find out. But by the time I had done it for a couple of years, it was working so well. I was so enjoying it that um, I knew I was going to keep going for a good while. And ultimately, 
you know, this went on for 33 years. Right. And you ended up playing with a lot of your students over the years. Yes, you know, I, I've had a, a, a lot of credit for being a discoverer of new talent. And, and in some cases, it's people I did discover legitimately that as I heard them playing somewhere uh, in my travels and uh, noticed they were talented and so on. But a lot of times, I just happened to be, you know, be there first because talented students would come to Berkeley and I would get to know them during their student years. And then as soon as they graduated, I would hire them for my band. And then people would say, wow, you found another one. That's great. <laughs> it was partly because I, I had the first look. Um, but there were many, like Donnie McCaslin, for instance, who's now doing really well in, in New York and on you know, David Bowie's new record and so on. He was one of those who, um, you know, I knew as a student and was ready to hire. Makoto Ozone, uh, the pianist from Japan, who I also hired straight out of school. Right, and and you're, you're touring with him. Yes, I, I am. Uh, that's correct. I'm doing this, what is my... My retirement tour. This yeah. is my. Um, I'm I'm planning to take a break from uh, performing uh, as of uh, the end of this uh, season of touring the spring, and I decided to um, do the final tour with Makoto. We've been playing together for over thirty years, um, uh, off and on, you know, doing at least some touring almost every year, and it, it, it these days in a duet uh, format. So. Uh, we start in Washington, D.C. and work our way up up the East Coast and then out through the Midwest as well. So uh, revisiting a lot of the places that I've played uh, regularly over the years so that it's, there's a certain nostalgia factor involved here. I'm, some of these clubs and concert venues I've played at, you know, for, for 25, 30 years, including the Berkeley Performance Center, which is where we'll be playing on uh, March 5th. That's, you know, going to be um, certainly a, uh, a nostalgic evening as I've played at that hall uh, for decades now. We talked a little bit about, uh, you know, discovering younger players and chemistry with other players, but we haven't even touched upon like Pat Metheny or Chick Corea. So uh, I guess, um, I guess if you could just speak about, uh, you know, how you knew the chemistry with Chick was so vital. With Chick, uh, I knew him as a musician around New York. Uh, we both arrived in New York at about the same time, uh, both coming from Boston, although we didn't know each other during the Boston years. He was about a year ahead of me, and so we, our paths didn't cross. But um, we were both on a jazz festival in Europe, and... Uh, not playing together, but playing separately. And the uh, promoter of the festival, it was 1972, uh, at the last minute said, oh, hey, how about all the, everybody on the, on the concert tonight do some kind of jam session at the end as a finale? And uh, it turned out the only two people um, among the players that night that said, oh, okay, sure, was me and Chick. So uh, we ch we laughed and said, well, okay, let's, we'll play a duet. And we quickly rehearsed something at, a, at the sound check, uh, one of Chick's new pieces, in fact, and played it at the end of the concert. And it was a big hit with the audience. And, and it, as it turned out, Chick's uh, record label owner, uh, Manfred Eicher, was there that night. And he said, oh, this is a great thing, you guys. You should make a record like this. And we both thought it seemed too esoteric. I mean, just piano and vibes for an hour? Come on. Really? But he kept getting in touch with us and pushing us to do this. So we finally agreed that we would. And we went into the studio later that year and recorded our first record, Crystal Silence. And it was that occasion that I that we realized, the both of us, what an easy rapport we had as players. Um, we just seemed to be able to guess what was going to happen next as we improvised. We could sort of read each other's minds. We, we hadn't played together, so we allowed three days of recording time, figuring we'd have to rehearse new songs and then go ahead and get a finished recording and that it would take longer. As it turned out, we did the whole record in three hours uh, with almost no... We, all, the record, all the tracks but one were first takes, 
and uh, and we'd finish the song and say, "Wow, gee, that went really well." well just move on to the next one. So next thing you know, we were done, and the record came out and immediately started building a following. We started getting requests to play concerts, and uh, and that's how it began. Um, and we and to this day, we still occasionally talk about this fact that we have this you know incredibly uh productive rapport when we play together of being able to just anticipate what's going to happen next it's almost magical magical sometimes and uh so that's why i think that's really the main reason we've kept doing it for 45 years right now in the case of pat uh pat joined my band when he was 18 years old uh, uh, you know, he was uh, living in Miami and had grown up in in Missouri and uh, was a fan of my music. Uh, I met him at a college jazz festival and when he played with a student band. And I could tell he was a pretty promising uh, player. I already had a guitar player in my band, so I wasn't looking for anybody new. But um, he was so promising that I encouraged him to come to Boston and helped him get a job teaching at Berkeley. And pretty soon it became possible to add him to my band as well. So we played together for four years in that setting. And then he went off on his own and became, you know, a really huge success in the jazz field, of course. And uh, it's, it's funny, we sort of switched roles. I was his mentor and guide during the early years that we played together and then the shoe went to the other foot uh, as the years passed. And Pat has become something of a trailblazer for music technology and knowing recording studio uh, technology especially. And for creating new uh, new kinds of, of music and composition in the, in the jazz area. So when we've done projects... You know, more recently, I feel like I'm learning from him uh, new things, new tricks, new new concepts all the time. So we've stayed really good friends and uh, very have a very productive uh, musical uh, collaboration to this day. That's great. Do you have any idea how many recordings that have been released that you've played on? Well, I know how many I've been the leader on. And that's 60, 66, 66 at this point. Okay. And I've been on many other records as a, as a guest, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a side player. And so in some cases, just one or two songs. In some cases, the whole record, but it wasn't my record. Uh, so, and I've totally lost count right, of, right. of those kind of sessions that I've done over the years. Um, and, you know, that's my, there, there's my legacy, all those years of cranking out those records. Do, do you have any idea what, what your final song will be? the song that you're going to play and end the tour with oh gosh no idea no idea so I, it's, it's not choo- part of a choo- grand scheme no <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know what the last gig will be but i don't know what music will we choose different songs every night right and we rearrange the order and so on um so uh it, at this point i you know i have no idea what uh will pop into our minds when we're thinking about the set list just before we go on that the, I know the last gig in the United States uh, will be uh, in the city of Indianapolis in my home state interesting interestingly enough oh that's marvelous but but thinking about that what is the song that you're most proud of like being your contribution to the world I don't know I'm not a, a real active composer so I can't say that, oh, well, there's a certain song, like Chick might pick Spain, one of his really popular songs, for instance, or La Fiesta, um, and say, well, that's probably the one people will remember me by, and so on. Uh, so I don't I don't have anything as a composer that uh, is that widely played by other, other musicians and so on. Um, so I really don't think there is any one particular track or one particular tune. Um, and if I was asked to pick a certain record that I've made, that if I was, you know, had to only pull out one and say, "Here, judge me by this one," it would be certainly one of the records I made with Chick. Um, possibly the first one, "Crystal Silence," or possibly um, 
the last one we did called Hot House. But uh, it would it would be one of those performances, uh, which just happened to happens to be you know among my favorites. Right. That that's that's really something that like uh, you would point to a recent one. I, I think that's really telling of uh, you know the, your own musical progression rather than something like that you did in your early years. Well, it's 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 a mix. I mean, if I go through the whole list, uh, some of them I'll say, well. I, I don't think that one has worn too well. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this one or that one, you know, I think is still really relevant today. And I listen to it, and hear my playing really sounds ideal. That this is what I would like to be uh, known for. Uh, you never uh, know when you make the record, really, how how well it's going to hold up stylistically and, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, I, you can only judge that, you know, a couple of decades later, I guess. Right. Well, well, we, when we do think about, you know, your more recent work and, and, you know, after coming out in the 90s, did did you find that sort of liberation in your personal life changed your playing at all? I don't think so. I mean, people do, people do ask me that. Uh, and it certainly it felt liberating, personally speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, to have that, you know, out in the open and, uh, you know, c- comfortable to deal with. But I can't say that it seemed to uh, have any impact on my playing. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I I kind of asked myself the question and right. looked at what I was had been doing during, that was about 25 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, it doesn't look like anything, uh, any sudden sea change took place. Um, so... Has anything in your life changed the way you play more than just hearing what other people are playing? Or I don't think so. I think it's been a very steady evolution, mm-hmm. and, and it's and as you say, I'm primarily you're influenced by the people you're playing with. Right. Uh, it's a very social kind of art form, not like a painter who goes into a room by himself and makes a painting or a or a novelist or something. With music, it's a, it's a very much a collaborative uh, art form, and you learn from and are influenced by the people that you that you work with. So that's been the, the biggest contributing factor. And of course, I've played a lot with some of the same musicians over the years. So there's been a lot of continuity uh, there as well. I, I love the fact that your first Grammy, though, was was a solo release. <laughs> there's something almost yeah. ironic about that. Yeah, that was that. <laughs> it was, uh, and I didn't. I wasn't even expecting. You know, in those days, the Grammys were not a, a big televised thing. And I didn't even know I was nominated for a Grammy. And then I won, and they sent it to my manager's office. Uh, And so when I opened the box in the mail and found out it was a Grammy, it was like a big surprise. And I thought, wow, you know, how about that? So I got more active in the Grammy organization after that. And, uh, and, and of course, the, they became a much bigger deal uh, in, in the next decade when they went to the live television broadcast and so on. Right. But, uh, but that first one, yeah, definitely was a surprise. Right. Now, now, the touring part of your life may be over, but will you still do occasional one-offs? No, um, I'm, I'm planning to take a complete break. Wow. And now, now it's I may change my mind at some point and decide to uh, re-enter, uh, you know, the music field and you know do some touring or recording or something. But at this point, I feel like um, I, I want to make a change in my life. Um, I'm 74 now, and I know that there are musicians who continue on into their 80s and 90s even uh, until they can hardly play at all anymore in many cases. Um, I definitely don't want to do that. So I've been kind of planning this for a couple of years now, uh, that this would be a good time to take a step back and um, see what see what life is like without the vibraphone and uh, without a, a schedule in front of me. What What is the longest you have been without the mallets in your hand? Oh, well, a couple of times I've taken like several months off. Right. Um, uh, once because of an extended recovering from an illness, and another time last summer uh, just decided to take the summer off, and so I didn't play from about May until October. Um, and I didn't miss it. You know, I was busy 
you know, in, enjoying the summer and, you know, doing vacation-like things. And uh, it wasn't like I was pining away for uh, when can I play again, when when is the next gig, and so on. I, I, like I say, I didn't really miss it. So that kind of assured me that uh, it wouldn't be a, a major uh, uh, challenge to make the change in my in my routine. Right now, do you ceremoniously put uh, something over the vibraphone? Is it in storage? It will. It will go into storage. Wow, that, <laughs> uh, that's a commitment. Yeah, it is. Um, but and, but like I say, you know, we'll see. Who knows? Uh, I have friends. Some friends who tell me, you know, it won't last. You know, give it a year or something, and you'll be back doing it again. Um, right at, th- at this point, I don't think so. But uh, you know, who who could say? Right. Will, will you still be teaching for Berkeley Online? I am still teaching uh, for the moment. Okay. Uh, that is also something that I su- suspect I will uh, also uh, drop at some point if I if I don't go back into playing more. Eventually, I'll feel that I'm not as connected to the music as I was when I was still an active player. And uh, and that'll make the teaching feel a little more uh, disconnected from what's going on out in the in the music world. So, uh, so haven't made a final decision about that yet. There you have it, folks. Jazz legend Gary Burton. He hangs up the mallets and puts away the vibraphone, puts it in storage, as a matter of fact, as he says, after March 17th. And not long after that. He may be signing off from teaching music at Berkeley Online. So, yeah, get while the getting is good. And it is real good with Gary Burton's Jazz Improvisation course. You can learn about all our courses at online.berkeley.edu. And you can visit me at online.berkeley.edu slash take note. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you soon.